Um, so once again, my name is uh, Alex Scott. I'm the branch secretary of Together Queensland, uh, the branch of the ASU. And today we'll be doing a briefing for members employed within the Queensland Public Service. Before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands that we're meeting across the state today, uh, and also to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, we'll be trying to get through all the material uh, within half an hour. I will try and speak slowly enough to get through the material. Um, but also today, we have turned off the chat function after feedback from the last couple of uh, sessions where people are finding the chat function a bit disconcerting and a bit distracting. So today, we'll be um, trialling uh, just doing the presentation plus um, the polling process, but we'll also be a follow-up email uh, where members can provide further questions or advice in relation to that. Um, but certainly we'd be keen for your views in relation to whether you think the, these sessions work better with or without the chat function moving forward. So in terms of today, um, the, the, in terms of today, the major component of the, the, that we want to talk about uh, is the cold rake review. Um, in terms of that uh, process, um, uh, we have the, the, the review uh, was announced by government um, uh, primarily uh, as a knee-jerk reaction in our view um, to the campaign being run by the Korea Mail about a range of integrity issues. Um, and some of those were, were uh, in, in dealing with particular individuals at a high level of government in terms of the integrity commissioner and also the state archivist. And there was a range of uh, concerns being raised that were being uh, escalated by the Korea Mail. Uh, and as a result of that, the government decided to undertake uh, the Cold Rake Review. Um, that review, uh, we weren't particularly consulted about prior to its announcement, uh, and the terms of reference um, were, uh, were, were, were kind of rushed out in terms of the, 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 the press conference in relation to the Coldrake review. Um, we have had a number of dealings um, with uh, Professor Coldrake, both uh, when he was originally in the Public Service Commission a couple of decades ago, but more recently uh, did the review in relation to um, the staffing numbers in the public service and his review initially uh, was particularly also focusing, his, his previous review focused on the issue of the Mori data. And so some of the reforms we've seen most recently in relation to uh, the staffing cap while it exists were improved as a result of that initial review. So in terms of the cold record review, uh, the Premier announced it. She gave it a kind of quite a short term time, turnaround time with kind of two months for an initial review and then two months for a secondary review. Um, and then just after it was announced, there was also some backwards and forwards in Parliament in relation to how the review would be staffed. So it's been particularly um, limited in terms of its um, resource capacity. Uh, and so no existing public servants have been involved uh, in terms of supporting Professor Coldrake in his processes. We've had initial conversations with him and we've got some further meetings coming up, but the review process was also quite limited in terms of the, uh, the nature of the submissions being put forward. Uh, we're we're quite, quite, quite focused trying to avoid individual cases, but um, in terms of a, a, a review process is a bit unusual in terms of the, uh, it's for people's capacity to get involved and in how exactly that review process is being undertaken. Um, that being said, the government also did commit uh, initially to saying they'd implement the reviews. Then the Deputy Premier said that they, there was a question mark about whether they would implement all recommendations. But I think the Premier has come back since then and indicated, uh, despite the fact we don't know what the final report will say, um, that there will be a um, commitment from governments to, to implement their recommendations. So in terms of the report itself, there is an initial report has come down after the first couple of months of the review. Uh, that report uh, is primarily about integrity issues um, based on where it came from in terms of the, um, uh, the concerns that were being raised through Parliament by the opposition and by the Korea Mail um, in terms of uh, two particular incidences around the, the State Archivist and also in terms of the Integrity Commissioner. Um, so the initial report, um, which is available online for people and will circulate the um, uh, the, the link to people if they're interested, um, talks particularly about integrity um, uh, entities being the Auditor General, the Crime and Cor Corruption Commission, the in Information Commissioner, the Integrity Commissioner, and the Ombudsman. Um, but also the report does indicate uh, issues in relation to uh, public sector capacity, uh, ministerial staff, and lobbying. Um, those issues, um, particularly the ministerial staff and lobbying, uh, don't kind of aren't significant uh, in terms of the majority of our members. Um, while they are very significant to uh, those people who have engagement at that level of government, 
um, clearly the, the, the majority of our members aren't in that, uh, that level of day-to-day -day engagement with senior government. Uh, uh, and so therefore there is less in terms of that process, but certainly the public sector capacity issue and what that means moving forward, I think provides us with a significant opportunity uh, for, for um, uh, real change uh, and using the Coal Direct Review to be something that is um, uh, potentially going to be a significant uh, reform. Uh, I think particularly uh, my internal and personal analysis is I think that, the, that some of the criticisms in the um, and commentary made in the current initial report by Coldrake certainly indicate that there is a willingness to talk about issues that haven't been previously being addressed. Uh, and, so, and that's why we think in terms of escalating our involvement in this review and giving members a strong voice in this process, we think there is some real opportunities to deal with that. So while his initial uh, terms of reference weren't particularly clear about what exactly he was going to be looking at, uh, the next couple of slides are direct quotes from the initial report. Um, but in terms of the definition about what integrity means, he specifically called out honesty and fairness as being uh, components that were important in terms of reviewing the integrity systems within government. He's talking about both, uh, particularly the issues about honesty uh, and, and fairness, which I think is significant for us. Uh, and then also talking about in terms of the assessment about uh, impartiality uh, within decision makings, which was part of his terms of reference. Um, he's also called out the issues in relation to fairness uh, and particularly around appointments about um, personal or other immaterial considerations not being part of decision making. So while initially I think the uh, the report, the, the, the initial report and also the terms of reference um, were kind of focused at uh, the interaction between integrity bodies, ministerial officers um, and senior public servants, I think the uh, the, the way that he's interpreted and defined um, uh, both the issue of fairness and integrity, I think is giving us an opportunity to have a much broader conversation beyond that. Uh, in terms of the integrity bodies he looked at, uh, in particular, he, um, he talked about those which were specific to integrity, but he then also um, defined the Public Service Commission as something different. So in terms of the areas where he's made initial recommendations, uh, the Public Service Commission wasn't involved. Um, because they have both a regulatory role, but also uh, a, a broader role than just integrity. Um, and in terms of that process, um, he also was then thinking about what the integrity system looks like. And in particular, they kind of picked up the issue from, from my perspective, uh, looking at the issue about uh, the ability for decision-making to be appropriate, um, but also the ability to have decision-making uh, being reviewed. So I think in terms of that process, um, that does open up significantly um, the question of uh, th that are available to us to make real difference to the way the public service operates. We now have a review where the government has committed to implementing its recommendations. Where I think we've got a reviewer uh, in Professor Coldrake um, who is willing to say things that might be unpopular with government uh, and make fundamental changes. And I think also um, while we had some challenges with Professor Coldrake, uh, we, when he was in the Public Service Commission uh, a couple of decades ago, I think some of the issues that he introduced in the Public Service Commission through the PSMC in terms of uh, review processes um, and particularly around it, appeal rights and other issues, I think there is some, some real opportunity uh, moving forward to do with that. Uh, and the other thing that, that in terms of this process, um, he has already indicated um, in terms of the initial review process was that um, that there was issues in relation to capacity within the sector, and he called that issues in relation to human resource management and HR branches, which is something that uh, our, our union has been consistently saying in terms of uh, the challenges about how staff are treated and our members are treated uh, is issues in relation to capacity building and, and HR generally. So the stage one report is now down. Uh, it's been um, it's been finalised. It's been released to to to, to the uh, on the web and as well. And, and there was a fair amount of commentary around that in relation to um, uh, uh, the, uh, the the media about what that meant. Uh, they particularly focused on the issue about ministerial offices and lobbying. Um, and there's also in terms of that process, though the, um, uh, the uh, Professor Goldrake has also indicated that the the stage final recommendation, final report will go beyond the issues in dealt with in the initial report. So it's not a fleshing out of current issues in stage two, but with new issues can be addressed and will be, will be talked about in more detail and or giving the opportunity for further uh, engagement uh, with, with more submissions for the next couple of weeks uh, in terms of this process. But 
in terms of the together engagement while we put in our initial submission and we'll be seeking, we have got a, a meeting coming up uh, with, the, with Professor Coldrake, we'll be able to put our positions to him directly. Um, certainly the, the options around um, uh, stage two are sig more significant in terms of being able to pick up his initial recommendations, the definitions he's used in the initial report and think about what do we then want uh, in terms of a broader campaign focus uh, to provide us with an opportunity to, um, to have a report that comes down um, that will deal with some of the issues. And so from that perspective, what we wanted to run through today and get some feedback from people today is some of the things that we've picked up in our initial submission, um, but also get some direction from members uh, moving forward in relation to this process. So in terms of what, we, what we've identified, thinking through how do we use the language and the terms of reference uh, that, that Peters has part of his review process uh, is thinking through the selection process. And certainly in terms of how we can change culture and how we can seek to have recommendations about changing how staff are treated uh, in terms of the process, clearly um, one of the significant elements in relation to what the power that management use uh, inappropriately at times in the public sector is around recruitment and selection. Uh, and so therefore, in terms of trying to have groupthink or trying to suppress conversations within the sector and have people do what they're told rather than providing frank and fearless advice, clearly one of the major elements in relation to um, this process has been, um, sorry, has been in relation to uh, the recruitment process um, and thinking through what that looks like. So. What we're keen to, to think about in terms of um, this process is uh, going beyond the, um, the, the working for Queenslanders and some of those issues to try and find a way of having a collective voice in terms of um, the, um, uh, the, the views of the public service and being able to communicate them uh, directly to, to Professor Coldrake rather than just the union office speaking on behalf of members, being able to have some processes in place uh, to show what we, uh, what, what we union members believe about the nature of the sector. Uh, and what we've been told by a number, on a number of occasions by members is that, that there is um, significant concerns in different agencies in relation to whether or not uh, there is fair and equitable treatment and ethical decision-making in relation to recruitment. So one of the things that we'll be thinking about moving forward in, in, uh, in, in the process for stage two is whether we should be expressing views about selection processes and in terms of that process, uh, clearly um, uh, we are, uh, there, there is significant concerns and that continues to be uh, an issue for, for members and um, we will we'll keep on moving with that. But I think um, by what we can see from those results clearly is that the uh, recruitment and selection continues to be an area where members don't have confidence uh, in that process. And I think in a historical sense, the, the failure of recruitment selection appeals mechanisms has meant a significant uh, loss of confidence over a period of time in relation to that. Um, and then moving beyond the selection processes, um, the, the key other area is then thinking through um, what it looks like in terms of fair treatment. So certainly uh, in terms of the lived experience of public servants over the last couple of years has been the return to office issue uh, and some of the challenges about how individual staff were treated with that. A number of agencies have done this very well, um, but a number of agencies have done this very badly. Uh, and in terms of the uh, the quality of conversations about how work return to office happens, what working from home arrangements look like now and into the future, and what those individual flexibility arrangements have been, has been a significant area of variation uh, between departments and also highlighting the challenges around uh, the capacity within HR and within management to have meaningful and respectful conversations um, uh, with, with public servants in, in relation to that process. So uh, that has been an area where um, uh, we, we, we think that there is continuing um, capacity for conversation um, through the, the, the Cold Rake Review to focus on fair treatment. Um, and what we'd be seeking there is understanding about uh, from public servants across government departments, um, where, what, the, what the nature of the, the culture looks like uh, and to what extent um, you feel that the, that the nature of fairness, which was now been picked up by Coldrake in his definitions of culture is something that would be, um, would be would be worth highlighting um, and also then thinking about that uh, in terms of a kind of broader perspective around managerial behavior. Uh, and I think particularly um, the definitions of reasonable action undertaken in a reasonable way is a benchmark in relation to 
uh, hazards under the Workplace Health and Safety Act. Um, but that then has now become, uh, in, in my perspective, a view that that then becomes the, um, if you can get away with, uh, with behaviour that doesn't, where people are unsuccessful in their work cover claims, um, that means your behaviour was appropriate. And I think certainly in terms of uh, the way that that reasonable behaviour, management behaviour definition applies, uh, has opened up the, the issues in relation to potential for workplace bullying uh, in the public sector, but also uh, whether people have confidence in relation to um, they, they kind of the broader question of um, grievance procedures and when people have confidence taking grievances because of particularly uh, in some agencies, the perception um, that if you take a grievance or raise a complaint about management, not only does your issue not get addressed, but potentially you're subject to retribution or discipline, um, uh, which clearly as it was linked to your raising of issues, um, but, um, but officially the department denies, denies that linkage. So um, in terms of the broader question, about how managerial power is exercised within agencies. It's a combination um, that we're talking about potentially around recruitment and selection being the withdrawal of the carrot um, behaviour around working from home, individual flexibility arrangements, but more broadly, uh, the broader, broader question of uh, managerial behaviour uh, in terms of how they treat staff uh, coming together in terms of a broader cultural question um, to think through. Um, while we've seen certainly in terms of that process um, the, uh, uh, some uh, significant outcomes in relation to the um, uh, working from Queenslanders survey, um, uh, it, the thinking through the, uh, the question about is that going to be the, the, enough to kind of document um, what the, um, uh, the, the, the nature of our submission to cold rate should be. Um, and they kind of, in, in terms of that, then thinking through uh, what our suggestion today is whether we should be um, not just making our submission based on the Working for Queenslander survey, um, but kind of building up a, a broader question to put to the, the, the membership um, as part of a cold rake review to get members to decide whether or not um, there is a broader cultural question. Um, we would want to try and probably talk to Professor Coldrake about exactly what his definition of culture is so we can make sure that our question to members um, is completely lines up with his definition in relation to, to um, culture, because I think there is some cha cha challenges around whether or not working for Queensland as surveys will be um, distanced um, from, from his report because they will, different words mean different things. Um, but certainly I think in terms of the broader question around uh, the think, thinking through what a workplace culture looks like, um, whether, whether in terms of being able to provide a stronger union voice and a stronger worker voice in relation to the cold rake review, kind of going through the steps of selection process, fair treatment and behaviour, all coming together to be a workplace culture question. Uh, and then using that to move the conversation to being with cold rake to being um, not just in relation to uh, how the integrity bodies work and also how does that, how does the, what's the relationship between lobbyists, ministerial officers and senior public servants, but um, to being a broader question in relation to um, the, uh, the view as to what um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the rest of the public service is being treated and whether kind of the fish rots from the top down in terms of workplace culture, um, that to address broader questions of culture, which um, I think what we've seen today um, is clearly indicative of what, we've, what members have said to us previously in the union office around the fact that there needs to be accountability mechanisms in place that stop the abuse of power, either in terms of mis misuse in relation to selection processes but also in relation to treatment of staff um, to, to make sure that managerial behaviour and the culture of managerial behaviour is better set. I don't certainly think from my personal view, I think we need to also be engaging um, with, the, with Cold Rake to, to think through what that looks like in terms of the role of the PSC and while he is Public Service Commission and while he's talked about that not being an integrity body, I think they certainly have a significant role uh, in terms of appeals mechanisms, even though they're currently heard by the Industrial Relations Commission, they're under the Public Service Act powers uh, and and the powers of the Commission, uh, the Public Service, the Public Service Commission generally, um, but also to say uh, whether there needs to be a greater control and, and leadership in terms of um, uh, the kind of nature of workplace culture and thinking that through uh, in terms of the public sector. So that's where we're at with the with the, with Cold Rake. Um, I think the the first report is limited in its scope, but I think it is significant in that Cold Rake 
has started to talk about issues that are not being addressed elsewhere. I think we have an opportunity, um, particularly given the commitments that the government made to try and drive the Coldrake review further, to start to make more fundamental recommendations in relation to workplace culture and trying to work that through. Uh, in terms of the other issues, uh, in terms of what's happening across the sector, um, we did want to touch on a couple of the other issues today. Um, part of those is around um, uh, the, the wages campaign. Most members online today are part of the core public service agreement. Um, there are members in transport and, and, uh, and in education who've got separate bargains up this year, but our members in, tra in, in, the, in the core um, have their agreements, their agreement up next year, as does child safety. Um, but because of the wages freeze, um, what we've seen is that most bargains are up this year. Uh, and so most people, will, their wages outcome for the second half of the year is yet to be determined. Lots of our members got a 2.5% pay rise in the first half of this year because it was a deferred pay rise from 18 months ago for the wages freeze. But we're now in a perfect storm um, because of a period where we've been able to get 2.5%, which has been above inflation uh, for most parts of the, the wages policy over the last 10 years. Uh, we've now seen out of COVID um, a significant increase uh, in inflation at running at about 6% uh, in Queensland, 5.1% nationally. Um, but also because of the, uh, the nature of the wages freeze and the deferral process, um, we have a com compression of bargaining. So outside of the core, most bargains are up for negotiations this year. And what we're seeing is that the union movement coming together uh, at the moment and talking about running a combined campaign about wages policy rather than just individual bargaining campaigns. Uh, and so in terms of that, we're engaging with our members in transport, in education, in health, uh, in conjunction with other unions such as the uh, UWU and other, other unions to try and build up a campaign about wages policy. That's probably going to mean a campaign earlier rather than just doing it through bargaining. And we're talking to our members in the core as well about where their ability to be involved. But this is also a campaign that's happening nationally with public sector unions in New South Wales and, and, and Western Australia and others. And we've been asking members to pledge to be supportive of that. And we'll come to members in the core um, and ask them to be supportive of it. And we're asking members in transport and education um, to be active in the campaign about wages in kind of July, August, as well as bargaining in September, October. Uh, because of the, the nature of that, that opportunity. So that is going to be is going to be something different. It won't change the, 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 the wage rise for core members this year, but it will certainly set the baseline for what the wages offered for next year is moving into the core bargaining and also into to child safety bargaining. So the ability to move wages policy now is going to be an a unique opportunity we have, but it's also a unique threat um, because of the explosion of uh, prices coming out of the, the various iterations out of COVID and the supply chain, as well as the war in the, in the Ukraine. Um, in addition to that also though, is there is, it's an opportunity to address issues beyond just wages. And, and so while we're campaigning and moving towards a campaign uh, about wages policy, we're engaging with government on a range of issues. And one of those issues that normally is not capable of being discussed in bargaining is around superannuation. Uh, and so while we have some issues in relation to uh, the bias against women and in terms of pe shift penalty and how that's treated in the superannuation system, particularly uh, in, the, in, the, in the Queensland public sector compared to the private sector, that's an issue, but more broadly, the whole question of um, how much um, the, the, the relative issue for public servants uh, is that we contribute 5% for 12.75 employer contribution, more and more that the government contribution is going to be set by minimum legislation rather than by the, the state legislation. Uh, and, but, but so in terms of that process, what does that mean for us in terms of our relative superannuation contribution? Uh, and we'll be talking to members about that uh, over the next couple of months. But that is why that issue on super is now on the table for centralised conversation. Uh, and we need to make a, a, a particular decision in relation to how what our view about the long term view about superannuation is given the fact that there will be minimums increases that we won't be seeing changing our pay packets for most public sector workers. Uh, broadly as well, in terms of that, we have also been uh, dealing with issues in relation to COVID and the employer COVID mandates. We've seen the, 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 the CHO changing the mandates in relation to the private sector in terms of pubs and clubs, um, but also in relation to art galleries and museums. Um, so that ch change of, by the CHO mandate has meant that the Cheddar um, one of the major departments has put a pause on their implementation because they were previously covered by a CHO mandate 
for the Art Gallery and Museum and State Library and also State Archives and some of their interrelated groups. There's been a bit of a, uh, there's been a question about what that means for them. Uh, and there's also been a question in relation to transport and main roads where there was some legal action being undertaken where the Industrial Commission has endorsed their power to do mandates, but that has kind of, uh, but the whole question has been uh, up, up for uh, just working that process through. Um, more broadly, um, the, the union has been engaging uh, with that process. Um, the, the level of consultation around the CHO mandates, has, about the employer mandates, not the CHO mandates, has varied a bit. Our expectation is every agency we've spoken to is continuing to look at uh, go, going ahead with implementation of those mandates. Um, but we've also seen significant variation in relation to um, the, uh, the um, uh, the, the, the question about the isolation rules. Uh, so particularly thinking through um, the question around what it looks like for um, uh, the, the fact that you previously you had to isolate if you had someone in your household, get uh, come back positive with a rat test. Um, what we're now finding is uh, as of last week, the, the legal minimum by the CHO has changed. And so there is the ability to for workers to come back under some, some circumstances um, to be able to return to work, even if there's someone in their household who has um, uh, been subject to, um, uh, to a, a positive rat test or a PCR test. So from that perspective, we're seeking to, how do we best give workers a voice in this, in this space around what, what is what's safe in your workplace, both in relation uh, to the original decisions around mandates, but more broadly thinking through what are the isolation rules are going to look like, what's it going to look like in terms of masks, what happens when there's another spike, what happens with the next subvariant, which might be less deadly but more virulent, um, but also working those processes through. So what we'll be seeking support from, from members today is our recommendation is that we take it out of the frame of the mandates, which were employer mandates under the Public Service Act, and seek requirements from the employer to engage with us through the, the Workplace Health and Safety Act, because that gives us a much better framework in terms of uh, future chest questions about rat tests, about masks, about isolation rules, to make sure we can have every power we can under the, the best legislation possible. Uh, and our, our advice to members at the moment is that you moving to a workplace health and safety legislative framework for consultation will give us better access to that process. But also for members in places like One William Street, um, there'll be greater capacity for a single decision maker um, within government to make that decision rather than the nefarious processes that have been used around the mandates where it's been not completely clear with shared buildings and one William Street exactly how, how the decision we've made about those assessment processes. So that means that there's been some assessments made under the Public Service Act about the mandates and also where to go through from here. We're expecting those mandates to stay. Now, that's all the indications we've had from the government at this stage, um, or from department by department at this stage. Um, but what we'd be seeking out of today is with support and what we're getting is strong support there from, from members is to think through um, that we would then um, uh, be looking at shifting the conversation and using a different piece of legislative framework uh, to guarantee that workers have uh, the, the real opportunity to ensure that you have a voice around safety uh, and that through your union you're able to best make sure um, that you can force the, the, your employer to deal with your issues, to talk about safety, but also to deal with your issues on a building by building basis rather than purely on a departmental basis. Um, so that's kind of that, that based on those results today, we'll look at uh, moving that forward. And we've got meetings again with the Public Service Commission tomorrow to deal with that. Um, in terms of the, um, sorry, in terms of the other uh, major changes that are occurring, the Public Service Act is now still on track. Uh, we've got draft legislation subject to consultation with agencies at the moment, and we've got a uh, session with um, the Public Service Commission on Friday this week to start to see what that legislation looks like. We're expecting it to. Um, be tabled in the second half this year, probably a month later than expected, but certainly uh, it's on well on track for processes and we'll be at the next session, we should be able to give you detailed reports in relation to the drafting. Uh, at this stage, the, the draft looks uh, consistent with what's being discussed uh, through the negotiations and through the public sector reform process. Um, but clearly in terms of those legislation, uh, it is often the, the devil is in the detail. So the next public service soon, um, uh, will be, uh, we're trying to go back, we've, we've, our office has just moved back after the flood and the union office is now uh, slightly relocated in South Brisbane, um, but we're wanting to make sure that we go back to uh, regular uh, public service Zoom so people can uh, have it in their diaries for um, that process. Um, and what we'll be wanting to try and work through is uh, at the June uh, session, uh, it'll be uh, once again, 12 o'clock 
on Wednesday the 1st, and that'll then give us the opportunity to, um, to work that process through. Um, but with any of these things, um, what we want to do is make sure that uh, we're speaking on behalf of workers uh, to make sure that the employer is able to listen to us and force real change rather than uh, having these processes applied to, to us as members. So in that process in particular, um, over the next couple of weeks prior to the, the next Zoom, um, the key objective for us will be sending a clear message to government uh, and to Peter Coldrake uh, about the nature of workplace culture. Uh, and that is only going to be successful if we can say that we're speaking on behalf of a, a significant number of workers, uh, not just uh, speaking on behalf of the interpretation of some union officials who work out of the South Brisbane office. So from that perspective, um, we'll be looking at kind of doing that, um, that the, 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 the recommendation that you, you've approved already today to say that we should go out and poll members on culture. We'll probably poll members and non-members in this regard to maximise the, the number of people responding. Um, but we'd also be seeking for everybody who's capable on, on, online today, if you can talk to your colleagues about it uh, and make sure that we maximise the people who are participating in this process, I think that'll be very significant. The more people we can get to fill in a poll uh, in relation to workplace culture, the more likely that Peter Coldrake will listen to us. Uh, and if he listens to us, I think there's real opportunity to make significant recommendations. And I think the ability of government to reject those recommendations is going to be uh, small, given what they've already said. But then they're also going to be a perfect storm for them in relation to the fact it'll be about the same time as the Public Service Act is being tabled uh, in, in Parliament. So there will be um, there will be a unique opportunity to try and get significant recommendations were reformed at the same time as legislation uh, being available to implement those re recommendations. So from that aspect, we think that, that, that uh, the opportunity for a slight delay in the Public Service Act by kind of six weeks or so will perfectly align with the, with the cold rec recommendations. And now we need to do whatever we can to make sure those recommendations come through in a way that will deliver real workplace cultural change um, and address the issues for the vast majority of together members, rather than just addressing issues in relation to ministerial officers and lobbyists. Um, the ability to make a big difference, I think, is with us. It's going to be up to what we do over the next couple of weeks as to whether or not we've got enough momentum to drive that change. So and clearly, in terms of that, we have got a number of members online who are willing to participate in that. Certainly, we will be talking to, to everybody across the public service about what this is and what this looks like in terms of an opportunity. Um, but thank you, everybody, today for participating. Uh, we will be doing the follow-up email to ask for feedback. Um, we're keen to work out whether or not having the chat function is helpful or not and getting some feedback on that. Uh, sorry if I've spoken a little bit faster than I have on previous sessions today, but we did want to try and get through both the cold rack issue and the wages issue. So uh, I apologise um, in retrospect for that, that speed of delivery. Uh, and there'll be some follow-up emails um, in relation to the nature of the cold rate process early next week, once we've confirmed uh, the exact wording of the question that will be most uh, helpful in terms of convincing him of uh, the need for change. So thanks for everybody for um, that, that level of support and your commitments to get involved. Um, please encourage people to attend these Zooms. Uh, we have got a very good return out again today um, and hopefully um, we'll, we'll be able to talk to you again in early June um, as to where we've got to with Coldrake and more broadly. And for those of you particularly who work in education and in transport, um, please get involved in the, the bargaining campaigns and for everybody else, uh, the, the note, get involved in the, in the wages campaign because it won't directly affect you this year. Uh, but it will certainly provide a significant base for uh, hopefully improved negotiations for the core public service next year. So thank you everybody for your time. And we'll, we've run a few minutes over time today, but we had quite a lot to get to. Um, but please stay uh, and hopefully if you'll get respond to that email you get this afternoon to give us feedback about the chat, but also in terms of other things you think you could do to that we could do differently to uh, make this process uh, better for you um, moving forward.